Okay. So thank you for coming um, to this session on Improve Your Reading Effectiveness. My name is Ruth and I'm a Learning Services Coordinator at the Student Learning Commons. I've been there actually since 2007. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm recording this session so that you other people will be able to watch it. And in fact, you'd be able to rewatch it from our website if you want. <laughs> We always like to acknowledge the fact that um, we are able to work and teach and learn at SFU um, by virtue of using land that was taken from the Coast Salish people, uh, the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, and Coquitlam nations um, are the relevant nations on the Burnaby campus, and um, there are different nations of the other campuses. And right now, I personally am located at my home, which is in New Westminster. So that's the ancestral and unceded land of the Kakai people. And also other nations have been here at times as well. Um, I just want to take a look because somebody else was asking for admission into the workshop and they just somehow disappeared, but hopefully they'll come back. Um, okay, so are either of you not familiar? Is anyone not familiar with the concept of the co-curricular record at SFU? I'm familiar with it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Taeyung is not saying anything, so I assume... Um, can you explain Briefy for like co-curriculum purpose? Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, whether you are attending the session live uh, or even people watching the recording, um, you can get credit on your co-curricular record of SFU for attending this workshop if you fill out a reflection form that you can find at this link. And I'm going to drop the link in chat because it's a pretty long link that is, you know, could be a bit difficult to access. Um, that here you can just click on it. Uh, but at any time, if you want to um, take a a picture of a slide or take a screenshot so that you can preserve the information or link, then that is totally fine with me as well. Um, so the co-curricular record itself is like a transcript. It's an official document that's produced by the university. Um, and it lists a bunch of extracurricular things that you do. Um, we hope that most extracurricular things that are, you know, not associated with your courses are covered by the co-curricular record. Um, so the idea being that when you graduate, you would have a list of, you know, various workshops you attended, volunteer opportunities, you know, maybe club opportunities, um, social things that might have been certified. Um, basically for your own recollection. Sometimes it helps you build your resume or respond to questions at a job interview, um, that kind of thing. So it can't hurt to get credit by, you know, filling out this reflection forum of what you've learned here. Um, and welcome, April. My name is Ruth, and we'll just start getting going with the substance of this workshop. Um, so I'm just going to give you this short uh, three minute video. We'll watch it together. And um, it's kind of by virtue of previewing many of the important concepts that I'm going to be covering in more detail. Um, and I was just revising this workshop this afternoon. I didn't use to show this, but so many of the suggestions um, about reading are to preview information in advance and develop a bit of a context for the more complex information that comes up later. Um, so I thought it could be kind of the same for the, the workshop, you know, having kind of a general overview video and then going into a bit more detail and covering a few more aspects. So I will just stop sharing the PowerPoint temporarily and I will share the video.
And this is from the University of North Carolina. Um, and uh, I think it's a really good resource. So that's not it, obviously. I just have to get to the right tab. Okay, here we go. There are three major steps in taking notes from readings. Number one, preview. Number two, encode, that is digest while reading. Number three, elaborate, that is deepen the encoding after reading. Previewing what you'll read is important because information sticks in your brain better if your brain has been prepared to receive the information. Doing so allows your brain to more easily organize the information coming in, and this in turn will help your brain to better remember the information. Here are some examples of how you can preview what you will read. Read through chapter headings and subheadings. Read through summaries. Consider questions listed in the chapter. Read through tables and figures. And most especially, as you look through the reading, ask yourself what questions you think the chapter will answer. The second step is to encode, in other words, digest the information you are reading. What you may not know is that the most common methods of taking notes from readings, highlighting and or underlining, are not usually helpful for deeply processing the information. Most students highlight or underline too frequently and don't pause enough to actively think about what they're highlighting and why they're doing so. Research suggests that taking notes after you read short intervals of a text will help you more actively engage and therefore better remember the material. After reading through a paragraph or a section, stop. Then ask yourself, what are the main and supporting points? Write these down using the least number of words possible. If you have to write another paragraph to describe the paragraph you just read, you're not digesting enough. List these points, preferably in outline format, either in your textbook or, and this is my personal favorite, in a digital platform like Evernote. I prefer writing notes in Evernote, not only so that all my notes are within a few pages instead of dispersed throughout a textbook, but also so that I can review my notes whenever I want, since I can access Evernote from my laptop as well as from my smartphone. If you're still convinced that you should use highlighting, then highlight the least number of keywords to identify the main and supporting points. If you highlight a lot of text, it's a sign that you are not digesting enough. Using the method just described will decrease the need to reread in the future, making your reading time efficient as well as more effective in the long run. The final step is to elaborate on what you know in order to deepen the initial encoding. The key to doing this is to ask yourself a lot of questions. For example, is there another way of organizing the information which would make better sense? Would the information be better represented as a picture or a diagram, or perhaps as a table which shows similarities and differences between concepts? Would the information be better represented as a sequence, in other words, a series of steps? Does this new information relate in some way to things you already know? How so? What questions does the reading answer for you? What questions are still left unanswered? The more you think about concepts, the more likely it is that you will deeply encode the information. And the more deeply you encode, the better you understand and remember the information. Sorry, I just have to figure out how to get back to my um, slides. Okay, so uh, has anyone already learned something new? Uh, you can either say something or put it in the chat if you want. I guess I can say something. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I uh, I already kind of knew that just blatantly underlining sentences 
and not really following up with that is not really an effective way of studying and reading. Um, I do tend to highlight some things, um, but then I always um, make sure I take notes or I try to at least take notes on what I highlighted and kind of go from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So are you highlighting as you're reading or like do you read a section and then highlight more selectively? Uh, I'd say probably a combination thereof. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I found like I used to highlight while I was reading and mm -hmm. that was a recipe for painting the entire book yellow basically yeah. <laughs> because you know when you're first reading it and you don't have the full context everything looks important mm -hmm. but thank you thank you for uh, volunteering that um okay we'll go on to the next slide so this is essentially the outline. And before the other two students arrived, I was talking to Tai Young, and uh, he was talking about the volume of reading, you know, how much there is to cover. So managing the reading load is the first thing that we're going to talk about. Um, and a related concept is being in touch with the purpose of, you know, why you're reading, because that can actually help you cut down on what you have to read. Um, a very classic reading strategy that's kind of the foundation of this field is called SQ4R, so we'll spend some time on that. Um, that's really a, be a better um, strategy, like it's very simple and it lends itself very well to textbooks. Um, it can be applied to other types of reading as well. And then we'll get to, you know, how to get a bit deeper. Um, and how to read critically, which is um, a really big topic. Uh, we do a workshop on that just by itself, and it's it's kind of too short as it is. So we're just really going to be touching on it. Um, Jeremy was talking about reading journal articles as well as textbooks. So there's a, a special section on reading a journal article and uh, also reading from electronic sources which again it's you know kind of inadequate it just touches on it when so many of you you know get readings from electronic sources these days um so would you say that like most of your readings are from electronic sources or most paper or just kind of a balance of the two I'd say for me, it's mostly online digital readings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, any of these other strategies, like, will still cover that. It's just, you know, special information. Oh, we have somebody else coming in as well. Okay, so, um, oh, the other thing I'd say is that often, you know, it's like, if you look at this agenda, it's a pretty ambitious agenda with a lot to cover. And sometimes I talk too much, and especially if there's good participation among the students, which I hope that there is. Um, so we're slated to end, I can't even remember if it's 7.20 or 7.30. Um, if you need to leave uh, at any time, then you know, feel free just to leave. And I will be putting this up on the Student Learning Commons website uh, probably within a week or so um, once it's ready. So you can catch up on anything you weren't able to stay for. Um, but if I do go a little bit over, um, then you know, you're welcome to stay unless you have someplace else that you have to be. Okay, so managing your reading load. Um, does anyone have any suggestions either uh, by unmuting or in chat about um, things that you've done to manage your reading load that has seemed to have worked well for you? Hmm. I, you know, I'm kind of not surprised that nobody has any suggestions because reading is very heavy in university and it can be a struggle for most people. Um, one thing is that I should point out, this is like probably the most pessimistic 
point in the whole <laughs> presentation is that there really aren't any shortcuts. Um, so it's more of a time management issue than a reading strategies issue. Um, just needing to like get a better sense of how long your readings will take and being willing to spend that amount of time. Um, I think in the 70s and 80s, there was something called speed reading um, that everybody was asking about and wanted to learn, uh, thinking that they could shorten the amount of time that it takes to do the reading. Um, but it turned out that that was a big sacrifice of comprehension. And when it's for, you know, a university course where comprehension is everything, uh, it's probably not the greatest idea. Uh, we still occasionally get people asking about speed reading, but it's uh, not our recommended approach. Um, so in order to allow the right amount of time for reading, you have to get a better idea of how long the readings might take, you know, and that's kind of the challenge that, you know, that there's a lot of underestimation that goes on and people getting behind. Um, so it's still kind of the first few weeks of class. And what I recommend is that, you know, if you have weekly readings for a class and they, you know, tend to be about the same length and same difficulty level, um, start keeping track of how long your readings take for that class. So, you know, maybe the first week it took two hours and second week it took three hours, you know, then you're, and then, you know, just schedule kind of the higher end every week. Um, so, you know, the third week, maybe you would schedule three hours if you had one instance where it did. And if you finish a little bit in advance, then that's great. And as you keep track, like your estimates over the course of the semester will get better and better, uh, and you'll be able to schedule it more effectively. The other thing we tend to recommend, oh, that actually, I shouldn't have put up the point, but I was going to say that sometimes when you're first estimating how long something will take, and it could be a reading, it could be an assignment, whatever it is, um, take the amount of time that you initially estimate and multiply it by one and a half and try to allocate that amount of time because things do tend to take longer or else you might get interrupted or something. Um, so I gave the example of weekly readings that might take three hours, and I don't think it's really a good idea to decide that you're going to do three hours all at once, because the reading is pretty dense in most university courses, um, and it could be, you know, a real recipe for losing focus or, you know, having a big headache and an eye strain or losing motivation and just wanting to procrastinate it. Um, there's been a lot of research on people's attention spans and the average attention span is about 45 minutes and that's the average so like a lot of people it would be a lot lower. Um, so you might have heard of the Pomodoro method of time management where you, you set a timer and you do something for 25 minutes and then when the timer goes off you set a timer for a five minute break. Um, that's probably a really good way to tackle. Um, your readings, you know, so have some intervals set up um, and don't just go like that for the whole three hours either, you know, maybe split it up into three one hour Pomodoro sessions throughout the week so that you have some breaks in an individual session, but also you're not expecting yourself to do some really intense reading for several hours, even with little breaks. <clears throat> Um, setting comprehension goals for each reading session. So getting a sense of what do you want to get out of it? Um, and there'll be more on different ways to, you know, figure out what's there because, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to know what you want to get out of it without knowing what's there. Um, the little video we saw was talking about previewing the material, you know, looking at headings and looking at pictures and, um, you know, maybe there's in, in a standard textbook, there might be a definition on the side or something like that. So if you flip through, you know, the, the what you have to read beforehand, um, you can start coming up with questions based on the headings and the, the, the diagrams, like maybe there's a chart and you have questions about what the chart means and what the context was or, you know, whatever. 
um, you can write down any of the questions that you have. And then as you're reading, you can try to answer those questions. And if you have specific questions that you're looking for the answer for, um, it's harder to just kind of drift off and lose focus and flip pages without really taking anything in. Um, another place that you could find questions to answer um, or, or even just goals to set for the readings is um, a well-written course syllabus. Not all of your course syllabi are going to be this well-written, but um, some of them list, you know, sort of uh, reflection questions for each piece of reading um, or objectives for each uh, topic or that kind of thing. And, and that can give you a sense of goals to set for your piece of reading. Um, a lot of times people will set inappropriate goals. And from that, I would say, you know, I'm, my goal is to read for this amount of time or my goal is to read for this many pages in this session. Um, and that is almost an invitation to go through the motions while turning your mind off. Um, so just, you know, kind of <laughs> mindlessly um, going through while you're not really retaining anything. Uh, and then, you know, at the end you might be, oh great, I reached my goal of 25 pages but you can't really remember much from the 25 pages, much less explain it in different words. So you basically just wasted a lot of time because you won't know the material um, for whatever purpose you need to use it for, like writing an exam. Um, so, you know, maybe just use the reaction buttons, like who has had the experience of drifting off and, you know, spending a fair, num fair amount of time on your reading, but not really retaining much. A couple of you. Actually, <laughs> most of you. I Yeah, I mean, I used to be the queen of this. I was the queen of um, spending time reading ineffectively and painting my book yellow with highlighting. Yeah. <laughs> too. Yeah. So, I mean, having some, goals, <laughs> <laughs> having some goals and specific, you know, questions that you're looking to answer, um, it makes reading more fun, right? It's kind of like a scavenger hunt. If you're, I've got a hunt for this kind of thing and your mind is going to be kind of clicked in a lot more than it normally would be. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, so you're dispersing the readings, say, throughout the week, so you don't have a super long stretch where you have to do it. Um, and especially, you know, like, even if you're just doing, you know, an hour at a time in 25 minute blocks or something, like, it doesn't sound too daunting. But especially if it's difficult reading, or it's, you know, not something you're super interested in, you might want to build in small daily rewards, you know, or even rewards after the session itself. And then maybe you have another study session later that day and you have another reward. Um, I'm not talking about necessarily spending a lot of money or anything, but, um, you know, say you're at home uh, and, you know, there's some YouTube videos that you want to watch or something. Um, allow yourself to watch a YouTube video after you have done the readings. Um, of course, you want to limit it, which is always the challenge, but, you know, something like that, or just, you know, just having something to eat or um, having a rest, something like that. Something to look forward to. Okay, so this here is some of the ways that you would be evaluated in the course that you're taking. And um, there are also things you could be looking for when you're reading, you know, so say if it's multiple choice, you'd be looking for a lot of detail. Um, if you if it's for an essay um, or, you know, a, a paper where you have some choice or a presentation, um, you're basically just looking for main, relevant, interesting kinds of ideas that you can build on. Um, and then, you know, somebody like, Ty Young, you're in, in data science, um, people for problem solving courses, 
you know, you might not have to read a lot of text in the book. You might, you know, have some questions and you solve the questions and, you know, maybe you look at examples as an aid to solving the question. Um, and then, you know, do maybe a little bit more reading um, to help you with that. So it's important to keep your purpose in mind because some people read everything at university as if it was for a multiple choice test. You know, they're trying to know every little detail of everything. Um, so it takes just a ton of time. Whereas, you know, you might not have to do that. Like I, I, I remember once um, I was working with a PhD student who was gonna do their thesis defense and she felt she had to know every detail of every article that contributed to her thesis in case, um, you know, somebody at her thesis defense was going to pull out some obscure question <laughs> that wasn't really relevant to what she wrote about. And it's like, you know, even at that level, you are not expected to know every little detail. It's, it's about relevance. So um, if you can start like, you know, reading, and I will answer April's question in a minute. Um, but, you know, when, when you have something where it's more your choice, what you're going to focus on, um, such as reading to prepare a presentation or a paper, you know, keep that in mind that you don't have to read everything. Um, okay, so April, what is your question? Um, I kind of have that problem where I feel like I have to know all of the reading and I am going to be going into psychology 100 and I know it's a lot of multiple choice so I don't know which how to pick and choose of what I need to memorize mm -hmm, mm -hmm. multiple choice is the one where you probably do need to read more of the details and you can't afford to skip as much um, but we've, we're coming to the next point which is if you're ever in doubt about how much reading you need to look at or what you're supposed to get out of your reading, you want to talk to your professor or talk to your teaching assistant. Um, and, you know, I, mean, I think it's, it's particularly good advice, you know, say there's this big academic article you need to read and you don't really understand the method section or the statistics and the results or something. Um, a lot of the time it'll cause a student to panic but that's not really what the professor is expecting of you anyhow, because like in a hundred level course, you don't, they know you don't have the background to fully understand it. Um, so talking to somebody can help ease your mind. Uh, and also I, I see you mentioned memorize, like I don't know what to memorize. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a tangent, so I'm not really going to go into detail about it, but we have other material on our website, recorded workshops, information about preparing for multiple choice tests. Um, if you got in touch with me, you know, by email or something, I could point you in the right direction. Um, because a lot of the time, it's not really pure memorization that you're going for. I mean, you do have to like remember, but at the same time, um, the multiple choice questions might take you, you know, somewhat further than that, like give you a new example uh, that you haven't seen before. And then you've got to identify like what theory it relates to or, you know, things of that nature. Sometimes it can, you know, be about applying concepts or about, comparing material from different parts of the course and that kind of thing. Um, all right. So now we're going to go for the really basic strategy, uh, which is really fabulous for these, you know, survey course textbooks that are designed for lower division students and can be used for other things. SQ4R. And some of SQ4R was actually in the video that we saw. So has anyone heard of SQ4R or SQ3R before? I think it started with SQ3R. It doesn't look like anyone has. So um, I'm not gonna show this other video, um, but I mean, you, you, you could either take a picture of the URL if you wanna watch it, um, or like today, I was wondering, is this really the best video? And I just went on YouTube and searched SQ4R and there's a ton of them and they're all pretty short. 
So uh, you can refresh yourself on that method if you want and get a different perspective on it than what I'm going to give you. Um, so the first two elements of SQ4R are survey and question. And this is what, um, what we were talking about earlier. You know, it was about getting a bit of a context, previewing um, what's in the reading before you actually, you know, get down to the details of the reading, you know, flipping through, looking at headings, looking at bolded words and pictures and charts and, you know, whatever. Um, so this is why I'm saying that it's particularly useful for these, you know, survey course textbooks because they tend to be set up like that. Whereas um, an academic paper uh, that's intended for, you know, graduate students and professors in the same field, like is, is not going to really lend itself as much to that. Um, so the purpose of flipping through and looking at those things first is so that you can start activating your prior knowledge. If you see um, a heading that reminds you of something else that you know, um, and it's a way of, you know, a source of being able to develop some questions that you want to answer when you're reading. Because, you know, being a detective when you're doing the reading is a much more active way that'll keep your brain awake. Um, so we did cover those parts. And what we haven't really covered yet starts with read. Now, read is kind of an obvious one, but it's like, how do you read? How do you do the the detailed reading. Um, so I was talking to Jeremy before about, you know, maybe you shouldn't be reading and highlighting at the same time because everything looks important. And that's kind of the same as, you know, maybe you shouldn't be reading and taking notes at the same time. Um, so what I suggest is taking the three things together, the next three, read, recite, record, um, is reading just a small section at first. So reading a paragraph or maybe two paragraphs at first. And then looking away and saying out loud, ideally, um, paraphrasing kind of the main points that you just read. If you're in a silent study space, you probably can't really do that. Um, but if you're not, it's, it's actually really good to say it out loud because the material is going through your ears as well as your eyes. And some people learn better through their ears than through their eyes. And, you know, also the more um, senses that you're learning with, usually the better. Um, but if you are in a silent study space, you know, just kind of look away and check your understanding by, you know, trying to paraphrase it in your head. Um, so this will alert you after just a paragraph or two, if you drift it off, because if you can't paraphrase it either silently or out loud, then it'll send you back to reread the, you know, one or two paragraphs, as opposed to realizing after, you know, several pages that you didn't really retain what you read. Um, the other thing that reciting does or paraphrasing is that it cuts down the information to the essentials. So remember in the video, it was saying, um, you know, that you don't want to write a paragraph of notes um, for a paragraph of readings, like you really want to cut it down. And usually when you say something out loud, it'll help you kind of condense it and zero in on the most relevant things. Um, so that is, you know, after you have recited, that would be when you would record um, some of the main ideas in your notes. And then the next part is review. And I think we're gonna, I'll explain that a little bit more later. Um, are there any questions or comments at this point? Okay. So I will say that if you go through this whole method, um, a big advantage is that you will remember the information better. Like, you know, it's less, you'll be more focused. It's less likely that you'll have to go back and reread. Um, you'll remember it better. You'll probably understand it better. Um, you'll be more focused on the main points. Um, but 
when you first start, it will probably take you longer. So if you're already <laughs> complaining about reading takes so long, um, you may be a bit daunted by the amount of time that you would have to invest. Um, I have heard, you know, from somebody else I saw talk about this, that you want to give it about three weeks if you're trying to do all of these things, if you think it would be useful to establish a habit of going through all of SQ4R, give it a few weeks before you give up on it because it does become faster and more automatic when you get used to doing this method. Um, but another alternative is just to choose one or more elements of this that you want to bring into your reading. So if you liked what I said before about, you know, flipping through and then trying to come up with some questions to focus your reading, uh, maybe you just want to do those two steps. You know, like I think really adding in any part of it could be a win. Um, like maybe you don't do the survey question. Maybe you just focus on the three R's. Um, so you build that into your routine of just, you know, kind of slowing yourself down, going through one paragraph at a time, um, reciting the main idea, and then recording it. That in itself could really help especially if you tend to lose focus and have to reread several pages at once. Um, so the final element was review. And this is a graphic that we are, we use in so many of our workshops because it applies to being able to retain uh, learning from readings, lectures, you know, basically anything that you're working on um, academically or you know, I would think in your personal life too, it probably would help. Um, has anyone seen this before? Okay. Oh, we have, okay, Jeremy put up his, his thumb. That's great. And Paula said no. So there's, you know, a variety of familiarity with this. Um, okay, so I will go over it. And we'll start with this black curve, the solid one. Um, and that is the one that I would call the curve of forgetting. Um, so on the first day, you have done your reading. You may not understand 100% of it or retain 100% of it, but you know you, you retain 100% of what you retain, basically, on the first day when you've just done the reading. Um, if you don't do anything to refresh that knowledge within 24 hours, then by the second day, it's dropped off steeply. You know, so you spent like a bunch of time yesterday, and now you really only have retained about half of it. Um, and I used to do this, like I would, you know, and the same thing applies to lectures is, you know, I would go to lectures, I would take my notes, I actually took really good notes, which kind of saved my bacon a lot. Um, but then I would just, you know, close it up in my notebook, and I wouldn't come back to it until, you know, like day 30 here when I had a midterm coming. The problem is that not only does your knowledge drop off rapidly by the second day, it continues to drop off um, so that if you don't refresh the knowledge at all, then by a month later when you're having a midterm, you really don't remember any of the information that you learned so effortfully. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, why did you spend all that time doing the reading and taking notes? Um, because like now you remember like 5% or something. Uh, so people think that they're studying, but really they're actually relearning the whole course some of the time, which is, you know, which is why like you might think, oh, you know, I've been to every class, I've done all the readings, I'm going to give myself, you know, two evenings to prepare for this, it should be enough. Um, but then you run out of time and you're like, whoa, that was just so not enough time. Um, and it's really because you kind of overestimate how much you've retained if you haven't been reviewing. Um, so the recommended method here is this choppy line. Um, so the choppy line is you do a first review of the material within 24 hours to move it into your long-term memory. Um, 
And then every, you know, week, every 10 days, you know, something like that, you pull out your notes and review it again throughout the term. So that by the time you've gotten to day 30 and the midterm is coming, you have, you know, about 80 to 100% knowledge um, going into the actual exam preparation phase where you might want to focus on answering questions. Um, as opposed to if you haven't been doing the review and you just really have to relearn the whole thing. Um, so you set yourself up much more for success by doing review. Um, and I do want to say that like it, um, there are certain ways to review that are better than others, you know, so it's, it's not really just about rereading the notes, you know, it's, it's kind of in a way like SQ4R in itself. Um, you might want to like have highlighted some keywords in your notes or have some headings in your notes. And that might be what you want to look at um, and then try to see how much you can recall. Um, because, you know, then you're practicing the skills of recall, um, which you probably are going to have to be practicing on the test, even though it's not just recall, you're also moving it to higher levels. Um, so, you know, it's, it, if you're just sort of rereading, rereading, um, this is not going to be as effective as depicted in the choppy line. Um, April? Um, do you recommend reviewing like your notes or like reviewing the actual reading? Um, it probably depends how good your notes are. <laughs> You know, um, you know, if you if you have good notes, you could probably leave it at that. Um, some people will take notes in their actual textbook um, as long as they can be kind of selective. Like that's that's also a recommended method is just doing a very selective amount of highlighting and maybe writing some extra notes in the margins or something like that. Um, you know, and if you do that, like, yes, you can look at bolded keywords or headings in the textbook directly and try to recall um, information from that. So it, it kind of doesn't really matter, but it should never be a matter of having to like read everything all over again, whether it's all of the textbook reading or all of your notes. And the reason that we see 10 minutes here, five minutes, two to four minutes, you know, with ever declining um, amounts of time that it takes to review a lecture or review a piece of reading is because we're not talking about rereading. If it was, if it was rereading, it would, you know, always be the same amount of time and it would be a considerable amount of time, you know, so it's not just, oh, you know, I spent two hours reading this the week that it was assigned, it would be like, oh, you know, in a few weeks later, I spent two hours and I spent two hours again. And, you know, and it just would be unsustainable. Um, but if you're doing it mainly by cueing yourself to recall information, um, then the first time you go over the notes, you know, then you, you look at some headings or some keywords or something, and then, you know, maybe you have to read a little bit of parts of your notes to remind yourself. Um, and then you review again, say a week later or two weeks later, uh, and you're more familiar with it because you did test your memory in your first review. So you don't have to actually read nearly as much. Um, you will remember most of it by looking at the headings and maybe you could get away with a five minute review. Um, and by the time the exam is coming up, you have reviewed it so many times already that you can probably just, you know, breeze through the keywords or the headings and it just comes back to you very quickly. Um, so even though it's really daunting to say to, you know, review what you learn several times um, before a test, uh, you know, after a certain amount of review, it becomes very, very quick. Okay, so the SQ4R is kind of a basic, and I mean, of course, it does boost understanding, but uh, as I said, it's most effective with, you know, pretty basic types of university reading. Um, so here are some other strategies. Um, what to do if you're finding something particularly difficult? That's often a question that I get. Um, so what have you tried? You know, so say like there's 
there's some course where, you know, you just usually have a lot of trouble with your readings. What do you do to try to work that out? Jeremy? Um, sometimes I just take a break and then try and come back at it later if it's really like kind of frustrating me. Um, or sometimes I um, look up online like what this thing is and see if there's any other resources online that could help explain it better or if there's a video or something of somebody explaining it. Yeah, those are those are both really good strategies. And I mean, taking a break that works no matter what it is you're working on, really, if you're confused or something. Uh, what do you do, April? Um, I've had readings before where I'm like, there's like a word that I don't understand. So I would look it up and then knowing the definition of that one word I didn't know makes everything else make sense. Mm, okay. So do you look it up like right when you hit that word or do you read a little bit more and then maybe look it up if you still don't understand? Um, most of the time, if I'm like, if it's not like making sense, then I'll go back and look up the word that I didn't know. Mm, okay. I'm glad you said that because, you know, sometimes, especially if English isn't somebody's first language, um, as soon as they come to a word they don't understand, they might look it up. And then that just makes the reading really kind of choppy because there might be, you know, a number of words like that. And a lot of them might not be that important. Um, but it sounds like you, um, you know, you would understand most of it. And so then you try to understand it from the context first by finishing the sentence, finishing the paragraph. And, you know, only if it is, you know, it, that would usually be a, a particular word um, that's kind of an academic word that you wouldn't see in your ordinary life. Um, then looking it up is, is definitely a good thing and going back to the reading. So what do we have here? And, and, and just as I predicted, I am kind of going a little bit long here. So if people cannot stay, it's okay. Um, yeah, so sometimes reading out loud helps. So we talked about how, you know, when you're reciting something, you get it into your ears as well as your eyes. And sometimes if you read something out loud, um, your brain works a little bit differently. Like, you know, maybe you've paused after a comma and the way that you've said it after that, it's like, oh yeah, that's the, that's the key. Um, so try reading it out loud. Um, you know, this is one of the uses of having a study partner from your class. Uh, there are so many benefits to it, but, you know, one is if you, you know, you just sort of sit there on your own and do the readings, um, but you know that, you know, somebody from your class is right next to you in case you want to discuss something or have something explained, you know, and that could be right next to you on Zoom, that would be fine too. Um, and then this is your strategy, April. Um, this is Jeremy's strategy, you know, about finding like a video or, you know, Wikipedia or, you know, something online. Sometimes it's because uh, I, I went to university before the internet. I'm that old. So sometimes I would just go to the library and find a different textbook for the subject um, that explained things more to my liking or even a children's book. You know, a lot of concepts in science and history have children's books written about them. Um, which are, you know, much more simple kind of introduction to the topic. And, you know, and I wouldn't stop there. You know, I would, I would go back to the reading after I've read the children's book or watched the video or whatever. Um, you know, and then asking questions during office hours. And, and certainly if you've been working with a partner and it turns out neither you nor your partner understood something, um, and then that's a good tip off that it's good to go and talk to Professor TA. And, you know, a lot of students are um, intimidated to do that. So if you have a classmate with you and you both go together, then it can be a bit easier. I really like this quote. Um, it's from the YouTube videos College Info Geek. And uh, I like some of his videos. Like, I mean, you know, this is something I have specialized in. And uh, a lot of the time he's giving really good advice. I wouldn't say always, but um, yeah. So 
he has said, try to read in the same way that you talk to a friend who challenges you intellectually. You listen eagerly, you contribute your own words to the conversation, and eventually both of you create information that comes together to make something new. You know, so that's kind of describing um, the process of processing what you read. Um, and, and the same can apply to if you're in a lecture. Um, I think it's a little bit less important than, you know, when you're trying to learn just factual information. Um, you know, say there's a multiple choice test and you're just, you know, supposed to learn this information without questioning it. Um, although, you know, it's, it still could be useful, like trying to put it into your own words, uh, bringing your prior knowledge to it would make it more memorable. Um, so it still could be useful. Um, but especially if it's to write a paper, if it's, you know, you're reading it to try to come to some sort of position uh, in the paper you're writing, it can be just very, very useful, you know, so like ultimately, um, especially if you are doing anything other than a multiple choice or problem solving test, you know, even if you're doing a short answer test or something like that, it's about integrating um, yourself into the reading, you know, your point of view, your way of explaining things at the very least. Um, okay, so here are some um, strategies for comprehension, uh, which also end up being kind of memory strategies too, you know, so memory is more than just rote repetition, it's about making information meaningful as you read. Um, so one of the things you want to do is elaborate the information and distinguish the information. So just sort of always think about how the material you're reading is similar and different from other materials in the course um, or for prior, you know, prior knowledge from other classes. Um, make notes about the relationships between course concepts. And especially if you're going to have um, like a multiple choice test, they very well might have two different course concepts or theories as the options. And there's just very fine distinctions between them. Um, or on an essay test, you, you often get compare and contrast questions. So just like thinking right away about relationships between different parts of the course can be really useful. Um, and if you already know that you're gonna be writing a paper or something, you know, you're always kind of comparing what you're reading to your essay topic. Um, and then if you find that, you know, this part of the paper I'm reading is not so relevant, you can skim and, you know, kind of go ahead. Um, another way to make the information you're reading um, understandable, meaningful, and memorable is to personalize it. And this works better for some subjects than others. So like psychology, education, a lot of the time you can relate the material to your personal experience. And if you can think of a personal example, um, then it's gonna be a lot harder to forget it when you're asked about it on a test. Uh, plus you'll understand it more. Um, so, you know, an example of this was like when I was learning about the Piaget concept of object permanence that has to do with um, a child like at, at an age where they, you know, when they're really young and um, if they can't see something anymore, they think it doesn't exist, which is, you know, why maybe sometimes their mother goes into another room and they really freak out or something. Um, so I learned that concept and um, I was with my niece. And I think how old would she have been? About two, two-ish, something like that. Um, and we were out uh, outside at a barbecue and my daughter who is older got cold and um, to try to warm herself up, she removed her arms from the sleeves and kind of hugged herself underneath her shirt. So her cousin saw her hands disappearing and and said, uh oh, and the cousin thought that her hands had completely 
gone away. And, you know, and then she brought them out again and the cousin was relieved and she, you know, put them inside her shirt again and the cousin freaked out again. So, you know, so if you, if you have examples like that come up in your life, feel like you're never going to forget the material. Um, if you're taking a course like, oh, here we go. We've got something in the chat. Uh, okay, sorry that I'm going so long, but um, this will be, you know, the recording will be on our SLC website before too long. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so like sociology, uh, maybe economics, political science, uh, it can be easier to relate the material to current events, and that makes it a lot more memorable as well. Um, and then applying the material also makes it more memorable. So thinking about your own examples of concepts, you know, so maybe you read and there's a theory and then it gives it an example. Maybe try to think of another example um, that's a new one because, you know, on the tests you might get additional examples. Um, you know, think about how, how the information can be used um, maybe start making up your own test questions, like to prepare for um, an upcoming test. And, you know, think about like, how would a question um, ask me to apply this information? And, and that can make it a lot more memorable as well. Okay, critical reading. I'm just gonna go over this one really quickly. So it comes into play, you know, a lot more when you have to write a, an argumentative paper, you know, take a position, um, give a presentation or prepare for a class discussion, um, sometimes in class essays as well. But, you know, it's mostly when situations where you're going to be asked to make an argument or take a position. Um, so here are some definitions. A critical reader reads to understand the information, understand the spirit of the message, and analyze and evaluate the message. Um, so April, with your um, multiple choice tests, I think really you just have to worry about the first one is understanding the information, you know, and then of course, like applying it, comparing it to um, other information that you're receiving in the course. But uh, you're kind of, you know, like learning it and just kind of accepting that, you know, this, this is what it is and this is what I'm going to be tested on. Um, whereas if you were writing a paper where you're supposed to be taking a position, you wouldn't necessarily accept everything you're reading at face value, you know, so um, understanding the spirit of the message is, you know, does the author have a particular agenda? Um, you know, why is the author telling me this? Why is the author saying what they're saying? Um, you know, and then analyzing and evaluating it is like looking at its strengths and weakness and, you know, sort of seeing like, you know, maybe it's one out of five papers that you're reading for something you're writing and, you know, and it contradicts some of the other um, papers and, you know, and then you want to be like, well, what do I believe? You know, is this, is this stronger? Uh, or some of the other papers stronger. So, you know, that's kind of the added layer when you're reading for one of those purposes. Uh, here's another definition. It involves judging the accuracy of statements and the soundness of reasoning that leads to conclusions. So, you know, it's kind of like the author is saying, um, well, here's something, you know, here are three things that are true. And they lead to, you know, this conclusion about this controversial issue. Um, first off, you're like, well, do I believe that those things are true? Um, you know, and you're not just going by your own beliefs. You're, you're going by, like, is the author, do you think the author is making assumptions? Is there, you know, are there research results that they're drawing upon? Are they interpreting that correctly? that kind of thing. Um, and then even if you do like think that all of those statements are true, do they necessarily lead to, lead to the conclusion? Is it possible that there could be a different conclusion that would be equally valid? You know, so these are some think, you know, ways of thinking while you're doing the reading so that you're not just kind of mindlessly accepting everything that's coming in. Um, 
So essentially you're thinking about to what extent is the author providing support for their argument and whether the author's conclusions flow logically from the reasons given. Um, and like I said, there is a critical thinking workshop that we offer, and it's not being offered this summer. Um, but if you go to the bottom of the page where the workshops are listed, there's a link to go to recorded workshops, and there is a recording of a workshop about critical reading if you need to uh, get more information. Okay, journal articles in a nutshell. Um, so I'm referring specifically to more research-based journal articles in science um, or social science. And I think Jeremy mentioned uh, those. Have April or Paula, have you read any of those kinds of journal articles so far in your studies? I have. Yeah, okay, that's good, Paula. April? Um, I think I have. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, I, I usually as people go on in their studies, they get them more and more. Um, and and uh, this is usually what the sections of a typical research-based journal article are. Um, the abstract is kind of a summary of the whole um, the whole paper. And then the introduction usually like talks about the perspective that the person is taking and um, refers to previous research on it. You know, usually there's several different areas of previous research that are discussed. Um, and then you get to the method, you know, so how did they um, study what they're studying? You know, did they do an experiment? Did they do a survey? Um, and often there is like a quite a bit of technical details in there. Uh, like, you know, maybe, you know, we use this standard questionnaire and this is the reliability of the questionnaire and this number represents how valid the questionnaire is, you know, so it, it can be fairly dense. Um, the results section, uh, it can be different things, but, uh, you know, often there's a lot of statistics in there. Um, if it's a qualitative study, there might be, you know, Here's, um, here are some excerpts from transcripts of the people that we interviewed. Um, and then the discussion kind of brings it all together. You know, the discussion is um, instead of having, you know, just kind of some random numbers out there for the results or, you know, just some excerpts, it, it kind of ties it all together in paragraph form. Um, it talks about the significance of the findings. Um, usually it talks about, you know, what are some limitations of the study, you know, where do I go next in terms of my research, and then the references is just a list of uh, the other um, sources that the author used. So that's the order that you get them in. Um, when you read a journal article, um, what, order, what order did you read it in? Like, do you read it in that order? Um, do you read it in a different order? Like, what do you do? Mm. Paula. Um, I typically read the abstract first and then I head down to the the discussion. And then if I'm missing anything, I go to the method. Mm hmm. OK, so why do you do that? Uh, because um, the abstract usually tells you like the gist and the discussion tells you like what you need to know. But sometimes you miss. Um, like how they got there. So you have to go back to the method to see how. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what year are you in, Paula? Oh, I'm in my third year. Okay, this is why you know this. <laughs> it's, it's pretty much what I am recommending. Um, because if you just kind of read an order, after the abstract, well, I mean, you could stop at the abstract. Like if, if you get to choose what you read because you're doing it for a paper or something like that, the abstract could tell you this isn't relevant at all. So yeah, definitely you should read that one first. Um, and then you next go to the introduction. Um, you probably don't have to read like all of the introduction, you know, or you could, or you could go to the discussion next, like Paula says. 
Um, I think like number number two and number three are kind of interchangeable because both of them are written in English or you know whatever language it is the paper's in. Um, neither of them tend to be too terribly technical. Uh, the discussion, you know, I think is the bottom line, um, just like what you were saying, Paula. So um, it might be good to, to go to that second and just look at the parts of the introduction that you need. Um, so I was saying that the introduction reviews like other studies and sources that the author uh, used in coming up with what they're doing. Um, so whether you read it second or whether you read it third, um, it's quite possible that they've reserved, they, they've reviewed bodies of research that have no relevance to your topic. You know, like maybe there's three bodies of research that they review and only one of them is relevant to your topic. So, you know, anytime you read an introduction, you just kind of want to skim around and skip parts of it and read the relevant parts. And, um, you know, and if you read a paragraph that's talking about another study that seems like really relevant, maybe more so than the article that you're reading, um, you want to get that source from the reference list and, you know, maybe read that source as well. Um, and, you know, the, the method and the results, like they tend to come right after the introduction and before the discussion. So if there's a first year student and they finish the introduction, which can be like even by itself a bit daunting, especially if you don't know to skip around, um, and then they hit the method section and there's like all these statistics about, uh, you know, the reliability and validity of the methods they use and, you know, and these technical jargony things about what they did. Um, you know, the, the student could freak out and think, oh my gosh, like I'm never going to understand the rest of this article <laughs> and uh, I'm going to fail the course kind of thing. Uh, if they make it through the method section and then they try to read the result without, you know, having taken a statistics course or, you know, really an, any understanding of what's being given, um, you know, then if they haven't freaked out in the method section, they're going to freak out in the results section. So it's definitely better to read the discussion first before you read the methods or the results. And the discussion will tell you um, what elements of the methods or results you need to read. So Paula was saying sometimes she goes back to the methods section and that might be because, you know, like you have a question in your mind, you read a finding and you're like, well, that's kind of weird. I wonder what they did. You know, <laughs> like, like I wonder, you know, what age people they were talking to, <laughs> you know, so then you can kind of search for that in the methods section. Um, or you might go back and read the results, you know, so like if the paragraph is saying, you know, that we found that, you know, this method was better than that, or, you know, this, you know, the experimental group, you know, scored higher than the uh, control group or whatever, um, you might want to find like, really, you know, <laughs> what are the numbers associated with that? How much more was it? You know, then you can look up that particular result. Um, I think, you know, some of this depends on what level of education you're in. So I know Jeremy and Paula, um, I think, are both in third year. So as you move up, like you're getting to the point where maybe the professor is going to expect um, greater knowledge and greater absorption of the methods and results sections than in the past. Because, uh, you know, you've taken like your research methods class, you've taken your statistics class, uh, you could be expected to understand those things. Um, but in first year, you know, nobody is expected to understand those things. Um, and, uh, you know, so like expecting that of yourself is just going to freak you out. And, you know, just like um, the slide about purpose of reading, if you're in doubt about, you know, what you're expected to understand and take away from an article, like you want to ask the professor, or the teaching assistant, rather than just making assumptions. Um, I'm just going to very quickly, this is kind of the last section. Um, and there has been some old research. Uh, it's, it's pretty old now. I realize it's from 2013, so I should follow it up and see if there's anything else, because uh, that's getting to be almost 10 years old. Um, but there was an article in 2013 that reviewed hundreds of studies, you know, going back to the beginning of e-reading. Uh, you know, with early computers in the 1980s, all the way up to 2013. 
Um, and the study was kind of like, well, if you have a choice to read on paper, um, then it's probably better that you do that than reading electronically, like both in terms of um, eye strain and tiredness and retention, uh, comprehension, concentration. Um, yeah, so that that's it. But I mean, I know that, you know, the platforms are getting a lot more sophisticated, uh, you know, so now like you can search, um, you can search electronic readings, you can highlight electronic readings, you can, um, like there's the e-readers, you know, that reduce eye strain and that kind of thing. So uh, it's kind of a personal choice. Um, and I know that a lot of the time, if you're, you know, faced with the choice of spending $200 for a paper textbook, you know, or $65 for the electronic version, most people will go for the electronic version. Um, so if you are reading from an electronic source, um, you want to do what you need to do to make the material more readable. Um, yeah, and I personally am, you know, kind of a fan of the e-readers uh, with the e-ink. Um, you might also, you know, copy it into Word, you know, to change the font, the background. Um, I'm no great expert on this, but I understand that if you have um, dyslexia, for example, changing the font and changing the color can make a big difference. Um, printing it out or even just, you know, like you don't want to print out a 250 page textbook or something, but, you know, maybe printing out some key parts that are particularly challenging for you. Uh, doing things to customize your display, um, using a browser add-on or an extension uh, just to make it easier to do the reading. Um, we have, if you want to take a picture of this page, that'll get you to the reading page at the Student Learning Commons website. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, if you if you can, you know, each maybe put something in chat um, about one or two things that you heard today that you're going to act on, you know, either in chat or just by unmuting yourself. Um, I'd like everybody to commit to a little bit of action because it's so tempting, you know, just to go to the workshop, collect the good ideas and, you know, and then you don't review, right? So then you're on the curve of forgetting and, um, right away you have forgotten about all the different actions that you were going to take and sometimes committing to taking a particular action will um, lead to taking it yeah so we have something in the chat okay so paula is going to try the sq4r method yeah so i'm just going to give you that caution that i gave before about like trying it for a few weeks before you give up on it because it will be more time consuming at first. Um, Jeremy would like to say something and then April. So go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, I think uh, like uh, Paula said, I think I'm gonna try the SQ4R because um, kind of at the moment, I just go through the readings, take some notes um, and then kind of forget about it. Um, so yeah, doing the SQ4R I think will be helpful for me. Yeah, I know it's it's kind of hard to know which element to drop if you don't want to do the whole thing. Yeah. They're all pretty useful. Um, April? Um, I liked how you said that to like study with like all of your senses. I don't know what method that was though. So. Mm, mm -hmm. It was, well, I mean, part of it was that recite bit in SQ4R, like, you know, just sort of saying things out loud, as well as um, seeing them through your eyes, you know, and also the, the act of writing things down and taking notes is also kind of a sense, you know, and that, that can help people learn as well. So, yeah, just bringing, bringing, you know, as much of yourself into the learning as you can, can be very useful. I'm going to stop recording at this point, but, you know, if, if you're able to stay, I have just a couple of more things. Uh, I'll just figure out how to stop the recording. Mm -hmm.